<laughs> All righty. Good evening. <clears throat> I just want you all to know that um, I'm not a fan of Graham Cook. <laughs> However, I am an amazing fan of Jesus in Graham Cook. So, I have a very particular job to do uh, this weekend, really excited about it. You know, we live in a time of really unprecedented chaos all around the world. No country is unaffected. Hundreds of millions of people living either without water, without adequate food, with no education, with poverty, no job. You look at things that are going on in the weather systems around the world. You look at wars. You look at crime, drugs. You name it. Every city is facing chaos of one kind or another. This is the perfect opportunity for giants to emerge in the world. There has never been a better opportunity than this to have some Caleb's and Joshua's and Daniel's and Esther's and Mary's and Deborah's, for giants to emerge in the body of Christ. In my own ministry for years, I've been developing five types of people. Explorers, pioneers, warriors, champions, and game changers. Because I believe that if Christ is in you and you're in Christ, you have to be at least one of those. You have the potential to be one of those. And if you're a big head like me, you want to be five. <laughs> Actually, I don't see them as identities in that sense. I, I see them as aspects of who Jesus is that you can tap into at any time for an individual, for a family, for a city, for a country. Amazing time of chaos. We need people who can live in the anointing 24-7. Even your dreams have something to say. But here's the thing, the anointing doesn't begin in your ministry. It begins in your relationship with God. It begins in your devotional life, and your devotional life underpins your ministry. This weekend, I'll be celebrating. I'm really shocked about this, because I didn't think I was that old. <laughs> this weekend, I'll be celebrating 45 years in ministry. I'd like to say, I would like to say that this year is my 45th birthday, but... That would be a total lie. <laughs> I am more in love with Jesus now than ever. I had some great mentors growing up in the spirit, and they all, to a man, taught me the importance of walking with the Lord in the Lord. And spending 80% of my ministry on Jesus. Because the other 20%, you know, I could do everything else. I 
And I've known over the years many people, I've seen ministries come and go. And when you analyze why they left the scene, typically it's because they had a great working relationship with Jesus, but a lousy friendship. And all of their ministry was based around what they were doing rather than who they were in Jesus. There's a reason that we're human beings, right? Not human doings. And it's really important that you realize that your, your prime anointing is to know God. It's to love God. It's to know who he is it's to know what he's like. It's to know who he is for you in any situation. And when you know that, there's no possibility for being scared or worried or anxious or any, uh, any of that childish stuff. You get to grow up into all things in Jesus. So this is my job this weekend. I'm here to re-energize your devotional life with God. That's my prime purpose. We're going to put you on, I think the Holy Spirit is going to put you on steroids. Seriously, I believe if you're struggling to know the Lord, to walk with the Lord, then he's going to re-energize your devotional life. And there's a quickening spirit that comes with this, which means you could have five years growth in 12 months. What you think will take months will take weeks. What you think will take weeks will take days. What you think will take days will take hours and moments. Because seriously, most of us could put our hand on our heart and say, I know I am behind the time of my own development. I should be further on than this. No blame, no shame, because only stupid people do that stuff. When there is no condemnation, don't accept it from anyone. I don't care who they are or what their title is. Don't accept condemnation, judgment, blame, or shame, because Jesus took all of that on the cross. So there's no need for that to be around our lives. We are totally free from that nonsense, and we're free to see the beauty and the majesty of who God really is for each of us. So here's the deal. You need to put your pens and paper away, because I'm just going to prophesy. And I'm going to prophesy what God is going to be for you in the next few years. I'm going to prophesy what he wants to do in your quiet time, in your devotional time, in your walk, in your life circumstances. How many of us know that God does not train us in a meeting? We hear stuff in a meeting, which is helpful, mostly. But God trains us in life. He trains you in the circumstances that you're in. So everything is useful. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think he's talking about you. <laughs> everything is useful. There is not a single situation in your life where God cannot reveal himself to you and talk to you and be something for you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prophesy over you and then you're going to get the recording of that, and you're going to play it every day for the next 12 months. And you're going to pay attention to it. I'm going to give you a little workshop to do in terms of how to unpack prophecy. I'll give you that this evening, so that you know that you know that you know that you know exactly who God is for you and what he wants to do in the situation that you face, no matter what that situation looks like. Okay. So, are you ready? All righty. Let's get to it.
Father, thank you. Over to you, my beauty. Beloved, I am pouring wild love into your heart and into your life at all times. I am creating an expectancy in you that is so outrageous, it will turn you into a different man and a different woman. Even when you were a sinner, I demonstrated my wild love for you by sending Jesus to die in your place. Now that you are in Christ, nothing can separate you from my love. There is no situation in life or relationships, no calamity in the world, no action or word from people that can ever separate you from my love. I put Christ into you, and then I put you into him so that I could love you in the same way as I love him. And that love makes you the beloved at all times. You can only love me because I have first loved you. Yep, it takes God to love God. Only God can love God. So I put God into you so that you could receive God's love and that so God in you could give that love back. Face it, you're surrounded. There's no escape from love and no escape from loving kindness. You can receive that love at any and all times. Simply ask, but make sure you smile. Every single day, you start a new life. My kindness, my power, my passion for you is new every single day. It's new every morning. I don't want you to carry over into the next day the stress, the difficulty, the problem, the pain that you had this day. I want you to learn with me to start every day fresh. What I don't want you to do is to accumulate anxiety over days and weeks and months. I don't want you to accumulate stress that's the plan of the enemy for you. To let your tiredness go into the next day so you wake up tired, you wake up dispirited, you wake up stressed, you wake up disappointed, hurt, wounded. No, that is not the kingdom. That's the world. In my kingdom, new every morning. You can beat the enemy by staying fresher longer. Every day is the first day of everything. You can have a situation that lasts months, but if every day you wake up fresh, you're not bothered. New every day. Fresh every day is the faithfulness of God. The world accumulates things. 
stress, anger, pressure. But in the kingdom, everything's new, everything's fresh every day. That's what it means to walk in Christ. And here's the thing. You don't take your anointing and your grace and your power from one day into the next. All that starts fresh too. Right? We're not trying to eke out the blessing of God, trying to make it last for a week. You get favor every day. You get blessing every day. You get grace every day. You get love every day. You're not trying to make it last. Not trying to spin it out. Use a little bit at a time in case it runs out. It's fresh every single day. That's what fullness is. That's what abundance is. Every day fresh. Every day new. Welcome to the rest of your life. That's who you really are. We're not people who accumulate negatives. We're people who are learning the joy of trusting the Lord because he's trustworthy. So that means you have to com continue being loved no matter what is occurring. Nothing separates you from love. In that context, situations don't matter. What matters is who is God for me now? That's my favorite question. Lord, thank you for this situation. What is it you want to be for me now? The Lord says, expect to be loved by me and expect to love others through me. This is your time to move away from negativity, to move away from doubt and fear and anxiety and stress and pressure, to leave it behind you and step into a whole different place in the goodness and the kindness of God. Because the Lord says, you're not being challenged by the world. You're not being challenged by the flesh. You're not being challenged by the enemy. You're being challenged by my goodness. You're being challenged to be like me. That's the only real challenge that exists. I'm challenging you. See me as big as I am. I'm challenging you. Open your heart to a bigger love. I'm challenging you. Receive the Prince of Peace. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you with the joy of the Lord. You need to laugh more. You need to smile more. You need to develop a bigger grin than the one you have currently. When you feel weak, that's when I'll make you laugh. Because laughter is strength. The joy of the Lord is a strength. And in times of warfare and battle, the best thing you can do on a battleground is look at the enemy and, <laughs> really? <laughs> that's, that's all you've got, really. Oh my goodness. 
Sometimes the best way to deal with the enemy is to laugh first and think of something to hit him with second. Your challenge, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to be like Jesus in all things at all times. It's not as big as it sounds because you've got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all helping you out. This is not a fair fight. This is not a fair fight. It's a good fight. And a good fight is one that you don't lose. Because that would be a bad fight. <laughs> there are certain words that you need to cut out of your vocabulary altogether. Fear, shame pressure, stress. You have to stop confessing to a negative. And I'll teach you that, says the Lord. But I don't want to hear you say, I'm so stressed. I don't want you to demonstrate your anxiety when peace is so much more powerful. So I'm challenging you with my goodness and my kindness. Since the very beginning, my passion for you, says the Lord, was that I would make you in my image exactly like me. Did you know that my plan was to make you as amazing as me? Anybody ever been amazing? Or is that just me then? <laughs> I'm confessing to be amazing. And I'm not lying. Because the truth is, you can't have Jesus in you and be ordinary. You can't be in Christ and have a mediocre thought life. That's not good. It's not kosher. It's not good. We have the mind of Christ, and it's about time that we started to use it. What if any difficulty in your life could be upgraded just because you know how to be wonderfully loved. When you're wonderfully loved, you have an expectation of that love. Beloved, Jesus has dealt with your sin once and for all. And when he died, you died. And Jesus took away everything that was wrong with you. And the Father says, we are not trying to fix you. We killed you off instead. None of us wanted the job of fixing you. So we killed you off and we started again. And when Jesus died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he rose from the dead, your old man did not rise with him. You rose again in newness of life. You don't have a sin nature anymore. It's dead. You just have a sin habit. Because there are certain things you're used to doing in certain ways, and we are going to help you with all of that. And this is what it means, says the Lord. When I look at you, I don't see anything wrong with you. Because everything that was wrong with you, I took it away. 
I was glad to take it away. We buried it. No headstone. You can't ever visit that grave. I know you're dead. I watched you die. And when I look at you, I don't see anything wrong with you. I see what's missing. And I'm going to give you exactly what's missing. You're a new creation. All the old has passed away. Everything is becoming new every day. And I'm going to, all the new stuff is when I look at you and I see what's missing, I'll talk to you about that. And then I'm going to give you that as a gift. But I want you, the ultimate permission, I want you to consider yourself to be dead to sin and learn to be alive to me. That's what we're doing in the next 12 months. I want to teach you how to be alive to me. I want to teach you what talking to me is really like. You're going to hear my voice. You're going to know my love. You're going to have an expectation that's going to be outrageous. And I'm going to turn you into a different man and a different woman. Because I want giants in the earth. I want people of substance. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. I've got plans. I know the plans I've got for you. Plans for your welfare, not your calamity. To give you a future and a hope. I'm going to teach you how to live above circumstances. I'm going to teach you to live in the kingdom. You're in the world, but you're not of it. I'll teach you how to live in the kingdom. The kingdom is a totally different game of life. It's like the world is playing baseball and the kingdom's playing football. Someone's going to get hurt. <laughs> the kingdom is a game changer. But Christ in you is the biggest change of all. And you're going to learn to confess who Jesus is in you rather than confess who you are in the world. You're going to confess your kingdom identity, says the Lord, because I'm training you. And I'm going to use relationships, those that are good, those that are bad, and those that are ugly. I'm going to use your life situation. Too much month, not enough money. Hello, I'm over here. I'm over here. Walk this way. I have something to give you. I'm going to teach you to trust. I'm going to teach you to move in faith. I'm going to teach you that nothing is impossible. And I'm going to teach you how I see negatives. And we're going to play a game together. And it's going to be fun. And you'll like it. Because I like it. I like it in you. I see everything in your life right now and there's nothing that worries me. I'm excited. I'm excited about everything that's going on. I'm excited about the things that are not going on, says the Lord. You're a new creation in Jesus. And we're going to prove just how new you really are. All the old has passed away. And we are making everything new. That's why every morning we start with new. So I want you to get out of bed and say, Lord, what's new today? What am I learning today? Who are you for me today? What do I get to see today? How do I see this situation? What do you want me to do with this one? And if you're smart, says the Lord, you'll write a journal because you'll be learning so much, you need to keep a record. At least it's something to hang on to your kids later. But your freedom is about learning to be a new creation. 
We're not fixing the old. We're just elevating the new. And you need to know, says the Lord, a few things about us. One is that we are not sin conscious. It's because we're not evangelicals. And we're not charismatics either. And we're not Baptists, Lutherans, Pentecostals, or anything else. We're just us. We are not sin conscious because Jesus took away sin. And we're not letting anybody bring it back. I don't see anything wrong with you. I just see things that are missing. A few gaps here and there that just need to be filled in. Ask me, Lord, what are you seeing about me? What are you seeing about this situation? And the Lord says, I want you to know that I'm only working on your righteousness. I'm not working on your sin. I'm working on your righteousness. I'm not trying to fix something that's wrong. I'm elevating what I gave you in the first place. I gave you a gift of righteousness and every day I'm going to work on that righteousness. And as I do, thank you. Any habits that you have will be replaced by something so much better. Because I'm going to teach you the provision that is in every situation that you face. So that my nature becomes yours. And you will process your life exactly like Jesus did. What I want from you is that you believe what I believe about you. In Christ, you have found favor in my eyes. So you have to ask me constantly what that favor is for your current circumstances. When I look at you, I see Jesus. And my covenant in you is my covenant with Jesus. I made a covenant with Jesus in you. So everything comes to you, not because of you, but because of him. All of heaven is attracted to Jesus in you. And I'm going to prove that. Hey, thanks for the golf clap. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's funny. I thought I was at the U.S. Masters for a minute there. <laughs> Never forget that you're in the kingdom now. And you have to play by kingdom rules. In the kingdom, says the Lord, every problem comes with a promise and a provision attached to it. There is no problem in your life that doesn't have a promise or a provision in the same space. So beloved, you need to stop engaging with the problem. I want you to think like this problem amazing brilliant if the problem looks as big as that how much bigger is the promise and the provision I want you to get excited I want you to have the grace to be excited OMG look at that problem I am so excited Lord what's the promise because the promise gets in front 
gets in between you and the problem so that it obliterates it. And then you're looking at the promise, says the Lord. And as you look at the promise, the provision will start to take shape in your heart. I know it's going to be a stretch. But you know, all Christians have stretch marks, right? The only reason I'm stretching your faith, says the Lord, is so I can get more in. In the kingdom, no negative can be present without its opposite also being present. No problem can exist without a promise being right there in the same space. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to your life. Welcome to Christ in you. Here's the thing in the kingdom. We get excited about everything. Because Jesus never came talking about problems. When we were in heaven, says the Lord, talking about his coming, we were like, Jesus, just talk about possibilities. I know you're going to be in the world where everything's a problem, but in the kingdom, everything's a possibility. All things are possible. So I want you to give them kingdom language and kingdom thinking so that you can turn a problem into a possibility and then talk to God about it. So often, says the Lord, what you've done is you've taken that problem and made it bigger than me and talked to me about that. I don't want you talking to me about a problem when I'm trying to talk to you about a possibility. I don't want you to talk to me about a problem. I want you to listen to me. I want you to come and say, Father, this has happened. How do you see it? What is the possibility here? Thank you for this problem, but I know the possibility is bigger. Show me the possibility. And that's what you pray for. Right? That's what you pray for. Oh yeah, baby, that's what you pray for. Right there. Lord, thank you for this huge possibility. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I can't stand myself. There's a scripture, says the Lord, that is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, the real translation of that is, is there any situation where I cannot be magnificent? You don't have to think about it. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nope. No. You're bigger than everything. Life in the kingdom is not difficult. It's actually more simple than you can imagine. You need to drop the word hard from your life. But isn't that going to be hard? No. That sounds like a lot of work. Well, I think actually being stressed is a lot more work. Because there's no end result. Right? Peace Maybe a slight amount of work, but the rewards are incredible. You're a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Everything's become new. And this is where I'm training you in relationship to be a giant, to be an explorer who explores Jesus, to be a pioneer, the first in your family to get a new mindset. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that would be a first. One, to discover that you actually do have a mind. And secondly, to realize, oh, that's not mine, that's his, but I'll take it anyway. And to be a warrior 
and a champion and a game changer. Not just for yourself, but for anyone you meet. Don't focus on the problem, says the Lord. Instead, use the problem to find the promise that is also present in the room. And a promise is usually the opposite of a problem. So if your problem is anxiety, the promise would be about peace. Therefore, your provision is an encounter with Jesus as Prince of Peace. Every problem, every negative has a signpost next to it pointing to something else. If you're fearful, says the Lord, in a situation, there will be a signpost pointing to perfect love. Why? Because perfect love casts out fear. God is not going to work on your fear. He's going to teach you how to be wonderfully loved. Because when you are wonderfully loved, fear is never going to be an issue. When we deal with fear, we make it an issue. What you focus on, you empower, says the Lord. That's why I want you to focus on the promise, not the problem. I want you to focus on the peace, not the anxiety. I want you to focus on the love, not fear. I want you to focus on the opposite because the opposite belongs to you. The other stuff belongs to Jesus. When he died, you died. All your sin and all the implications and consequences were placed on him. So he died with your anxiety, with your fear, with your stress, with your anger, whatever it is that's negative, all the things that were written against you, he nailed them to a tree too. So every negative thought and emotion that you have all belongs to him because he paid a price for it. So if you get stressed, you're being illegal. That's illegal behavior in the kingdom. It's like you snatching something back from the grave. Oh, I know you died for my anxiety, but I like it. I think I'll take it back. Illegal behavior. Slap yourself on the wrist right now. Bad Christian. We don't do that stuff. Jesus died to give us the opposite. And this is where your anointing is at its most powerful. When you realize what the kingdom is like, and you realize the lengths that God has gone to in Christ to set you free. He that is dead is free from sin and the effect of it. You're free from negativity. You're free from negative emotions. You're free from all that stress and stuff. You're free. What you're learning is how to move in the opposite spirit. You don't need counseling for that. You need discipling. Fortunately, you have one of the best disciplers that this universe has ever seen. It's called the Holy Spirit. Who's going to take all the things that belong to Jesus and show them to you? It's going to take all that negative. Let's look at that negative. This is what I want you to have. Now let go of it. No, I'm serious. Let go of it. No, Graham, let go of it. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> Great, let go. Because you can't take hold of this until you let go of that. It's an exchange. It's new for old every day of your life. Every day. Jesus said, come to me, those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
take my yoke upon you and partner with me and I'll give you rest to your soul. So when you have a negative and he comes with the opposite, he's saying, partner with me. Get rid of that, lay it aside, take hold of this. This is what I'm giving you. You and I are going to partner with rest. No, I'm not dealing with you being heavy laden. It's just a mindset. You can get rid of it. But I'm going to teach you the mindset of rest. I'm going to teach you how to think rest. I'm going to teach you how to pursue rest. I'm going to teach you how to enjoy rest. And that will turn you into a different person. And all your friends will bless me, says the Lord. If all of heaven is attracted to Jesus in you, that makes you a magnet for blessing. Come on. Come on. If all of heaven is attracted to Jesus in you, that makes you a magnet for blessing. In fact, really, you have to be a complete pelican not to get blessed. It's really hard not to get blessed when God is so full of abundance and grace and favor towards us. He is rich in grace. You know, the issue with grace is not hyper grace, greasy grace. That's just nonsense. The real issue in grace is, are you rich or are you poor? So if God is rich in grace and you're poor in grace, guess who needs to do some work? I somehow don't think the Lord's going to say, oh, that's my bad. I'm being too good, too generous, too amazing. I'll try and tone it down. You know, if grace is undeserved favor, Jesus never had any. But the Bible says he grew in grace with God and man. But if grace is undeserved favor, then Jesus must have done something wrong to deserve that kind of grace, which would disqualify him from being the Savior. Right? Because he's now not the spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Can't have it both ways. So, either Jesus is not qualified to be the Savior, or we need a better definition of grace. Okay. This is the definition that the Lord taught me. Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables you to become the man or the woman that God sees when he looks at you. Do you want me to say it in English? Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables you to become the man and the woman that God sees when he looks at you. Jesus was not God pretending to be a man. He was a man learning to live in right relationship with God. And God gave him grace because grace is empowering presence. God put you into Jesus. He put Jesus into you so you would always have empowering presence. Always, every day of your life, for every situation you encounter, empowering presence. Every time you see the word grace in the New Testament, substitute it with the words empowering presence and see what that does for your spirit. Grace is majestic. We rule, we reign in life through grace and the gift of righteousness. Grace is a ruling power in your heart. See how easy God is making all of this? 
So easy, an Englishman can do it. Seriously. A hard life is when you're always trying to fix something that Jesus took away. A hard life is to have a mindset based on the old rather than a mindset based on the new. It's hard dealing with the old man because it's futile. So the Lord is saying, I love impossible situations. So why don't you let me into yours? I love all the difficult stuff. Why don't you share it with me? Why don't we partner together? All things are possible. He also wants to say to you, I am making war on all your negativity. Whose side do you want to be on? I'm making war on all your negative thinking. I'm making war on all your negative emotions. I'm making war on all your negative language. Whose team do you want to be on? I would qualify as a no-brainer. Serious as a heart attack. This is the real stuff that really matters. And once you come to a point of mastering those things and learning to live a life above those things, then you're on your way to being a giant. Then you're on your way to being a game changer and a champion and a pioneer. Someone who does something for the first time. Someone who doesn't lose. Someone who changes the game everywhere they go. Welcome to Jesus. Welcome to life in the Spirit. Now, God is really serious about the negative stuff. The Lord says, I know exactly what I want to do in you. My eye is single. I have this focus to make you like me. When you feel weak, I'll teach you to laugh because joy is strength. And every time I talk to you, my joy will rise up in you because your spirit is programmed to the word. And when the word comes forth, joy rises up. The joy of hearing that word the joy of entering that conversation with the Lord, the joy in that thought rises up on the inside of you. There's a quickening spirit in Jesus. Five years of growth in 12 months, if you want it. You being a new person, a new mind, a new heart, a new and living way, walking in that, trading old for new, new every morning, learning to live in total newness of life. And all of that begins in your devotional life with me. All of that begins using every life circumstance you have. I'll teach you the joy of living in the kingdom. That's my plan. What's yours? I have plans for you. And that plan is for you to grow up into Christ in all things. 
That plan is for you to give him the preeminence in all things. That plan is to take you so far above your circumstances. You'll be living from a completely different realm. So Father, I thank you. What you're saying to us, Father, is we've just entered into a land of promise. We crossed Jordan. We're in a land of promise where outrageous things are going to happen. Slaves turned into free men. Living in houses we didn't build, drinking from wells we never had to dig, having vineyards that we never planted, turnkey operation. You're going to do amazing, astonishing things in our lives, and our lives are going to be a testimony, and the testimony is the beginning of ministry. When we are anointed in our relationship with you, we have a testimony that totally rocket fires our ministry into a whole different place. So Father, I thank you for what you plan and for what you purpose. This next 12 months is going to be the most amazing time we've ever had in life and relationship with you. And so many things are going to happen this year. It'll feel like we've just lived five years in one. So Lord, I ask for a quickening spirit. Everybody who listens to this, whether you were here or not, is irrelevant. It's for you. It's for the body. Lord, I pray for a quickening spirit. I pray for a divine acceleration upon each one of us. And I ask that the joy of the Lord will be our company, our ongoing company day after day. The sheer joy of being made like you. The sheer joy of hearing your voice, of seeing what you see, of knowing what you know, of becoming what you want us to become like you. That our hearts will be gripped by a joy and stress and pressure and anxiety and fear will be things of the past. They will leave and they will never return. Well, I pray that you'll make it so in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to me in that. I just want to give you some cool instructions because when you get a download of that prophecy, then I want you to write it out because the act of writing it out will actually, things will begin to form on the inside of you. If you're a millennial, don't worry. There are things called pens <laughs> and you can use one. It might seem impossible right now, but maybe that's your first impossible thing. You need to write it out because the act, something will get started on the inside of you. So write it out in paragraph form and study each sentence. Look for key words and phrases that are descriptive of how God sees you or of what God wants to be for you right now. Ask questions. What are the specific permissions, promises, and declarations that the Lord is connecting you to in his plan for you? They'll be there, and they'll jump off the page at you. Are there any commands or requests from him to which you must pay attention? So when he's talking, when you read about anxiety and you've been anxious, You've got to know at that point, he's looking at you and he's raising his eyebrows and saying, come on, give me that sucker. <laughs> that doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. He died for it. He paid a price for it. It's his and you can't have it because that's illegal. Give it up. 
That's what I'm talking about. How many times does the same word or phrase or theme occur in that word? And you can, don't just use it on this word, use it on any other word that you've got. And if God has given you particular scriptures, use it on those too. Because we need to study the words that God has given to us specifically. What can you step into regarding the promises of God? What upgrades in relationship are now available? And what's he saying about your identity that you can begin to confess and declare? So as you read through it, begin to think along those pathways and see what begins to emerge because that is where you will partner with God effectively and efficiently. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it.